and welcome back for your second taste of gustation. Now that we've covered how taste is transduced and how it's encoded in the brain, today we'll be dealing with how taste sensations are integrated with other senses and how top-down information affects perception. And we're gonna use these to try and tackle the question, why do people like the foods they do? I told you on the first day that we each walk in our own perceptual worlds. We differ from one another in how we experience flavors and why we like what we like. How come? Why am I really excited about a spicy burrito full of cilantro and a cold beer, but those things would make my mom cry. To answer this question, we're gonna again deal with the fact that flavor is the result of the combined experience of many different sensations. So individual differences in the flavors that we like may stem from individual differences in any of these sensory experiences. So let's start with taste. Why do people differ in how they experience taste? One explanation for these individual differences is that people experience tastes differently depending on their genotype. There are many different genes that code for uh, taste receptors, but one particularly notable one is called Taster38. These genes code for a particular type of bitter gustatory receptor. You read last time about PTC, a substance that is perceived by some people as tasting quite bitter and other people as not tasting like anything. Well, it turns out that this is due in part to people's uh, uh, taster status, that is, what, what type of taster 38 alleles they have. So there are two different alleles of this gene that can combine in three different ways. So people who have two copies of the dominant PAV, PAV allele are very sensitive to PTC. They taste PTC and experience it as incredibly bitter. People with one copy are moderately sensitive. They'll taste it and say, yeah, it's kind of bitter. People with, with two copies of the recessive allele, people who are whose status is a, AVI, AVI, uh, are not at all sensitive to it. So you can put PTC directly on their tongue and they don't experience anything at all. So a PAV, PAV person and an AVI, AVI person can be given the exact same substance, the exact same Brussels sprouts or beer or coffee or other bitter substance, and one may find it incredibly bitter and the other may not. So individual differences may be influenced in part by the intensity of those sensory experiences that some people have. In addition to individual differences in the types of receptors that people have, people also differ in the physiology of their tongue, which can affect how they experience tastes. We talked last time about fungiform papilla, where taste transduction happens. Uh, I'm gonna show you some tongue pictures where the tongues have been dyed blue to make the fungiform papilla more visually apparent. So the fungiform papilla are the little slightly less blue dots that appear on the tongue. And you can see that the picture on the top, that person has a really dense concentration of fungiform papilla, right? They're just like packed into the tongue. But the person on the bottom has, has many fewer of them. So it turns out that people differ very dramatically in the density of papilla. Uh, and more papilla means more gustatory receptor cells, which means more neural activity with, with every taste it. People who have a high density of papilla therefore experience tastes more intensely. Let's watch a video where you can see what this tongue dyeing looks like. The researcher in this video is Linda Bartoshuk. She's one of the most prominent researchers on taste perception in the world, if not the most prominent. She's done extensive work uh, to help us understand taste perception and even coined the term super taster. And she's a Carl, class of 1960. She was apparently originally gonna be an astronomy major, but then was really interested in the fact that there were individual differences in how people were looking at stars, right? That some people could see very dim ones and other one weren't. She went on to study perception, become a psychology major, and you know, now is a world famous researcher. But it all started right here at Carleton. Okay, so people who have high papilla density are more sensitive to most tastes, not just bitter, meaning that they can detect them at lower concentrations and experience those tastes more intensely. My mom happens to have a very high density of fungiform papilla. I know that because I look at my loved one's tongues to try and understand their preferences. So her high sensitivity may be why she doesn't like beer. Hey mom, do you like beer? Oh, so bitter. <sighs> but individual differences in taste perception aren't all hardwired. Our taste experiences are also affected by what we have recently been exposed to. 
So in this study, uh, the researchers asked participants to either consume a high sodium diet or a low sodium diet. And then after two weeks on that diet, they looked at their preferences for different kinds of foods. And they found that the people who had eaten a lot of salty foods needed higher levels of salt in order to experience the same level of saltiness. So their preferences change based on that, that two weeks of exposure. Other individual differences can affect our taste preferences as well. For example, people who smoke and people who have depression tend to be less sensitive to some tastes. Uh, taste sensitivity also changes as we get older. Thus, as you age, you need more of a stimulus to be present in order to detect that it is present. If I put sugar in my tea and my grandmother puts sugar in her tea, she'll probably need more, more sugar in order to experience that the tea is at all sweet. Okay, so individual differences in flavor preferences stem in part from individual differences in how we taste. But as we talked about before, flavor is also heavily influenced by our sense of smell. Let's watch a video to see how. So individual differences in flavor also depend heavily on individual differences in olfaction. But this isn't just a cute video, it also works in the lab. If you give people different substances with their nose plugged or not, people are much worse at identifying substances when they can't smell them. Yeah, it's tea. So smell affects flavor, and we differ from one another tremendously in our senses of smell. The tea taster you saw in the video uh, has an unremarkable tongue, but a very special sniffer, right? He experiences olfactory stimuli differently than most people do. We'll talk a lot about olfactory sensitivity and individual differences in olfaction next time, um, but just, just as a little teaser, we each walk in our own perceptual world, and this is particularly true of smell. There are tremendous individual differences in how people experience smells. Different things smell different to different people. More on this next time, but for now I'll just say, my mom doesn't like cilantro, but I do, in part because we differ in the genes that code for the odor of cilantro. Hey mom, what do you think about cilantro? It's just like having a mouthful of soap. Individual differences can also come as we age. We'll talk about this in every sensory system. Older people experience smells less strongly, which may affect their flavor preferences. If we're making cookies, we have to put in more cinnamon in order for my grandma to be able to detect the presence of cinnamon than for me to be able to detect it. Flavor is also affected by our sense of touch. So somatosensation here refers to the sensations of texture and temperature and other touch sensation like pain, spiciness, mintiness, and so forth. So how do we assess the contributions of somatosensation to flavor? How do we know if texture affects how we perceive flavors? If we want to test for olfaction, just plug people's noses. But how do you get rid of somatosensory input when you're having people experience different flavors? The answer is you blend them up. So researchers take foods, give them to people intact or give them to people blended. And perhaps unsurprisingly, people are less accurate at identifying what a food is when they don't have access to those texture cues. So people are less good at identifying the flavors when the food is blended than, than when it's whole. Imagine biting into an apple versus a pear. It's probably pretty easy to differentiate those even if your eyes are closed because of how they smell and how they feel in your mouth. But imagine having a spoonful of applesauce versus pear sauce, even though the smells are going to be consistent, it's going to be much trickier to differentiate between them because even if you don't realize it, you're using that texture information to know what is what. I already mentioned that people who have a higher fungiform papilla density experience tastes more intensely. Well, those cute little papilla don't just have taste receptors in them. They also have somatosensory nerve endings in them as well. So people with more papilla also experience somatosensory experiences more intensely. Spicy things are spicier, creamy things are creamier. So it's easy for people with lots of fungiform papilla to be overwhelmed by these sensory experiences. So my mom, with her high density of fungiform papilla, when she bites into something spicy, she experiences it as much more spicy than I do. Hey mom, what do you think about spicy food? It burns. <gasps> but our preferences for spiciness isn't just a function of what's on our tongues. 
Remarkably, even personality may affect our flavor preferences. For preferences for spicy food, people who, are, who score high on measures of sensation-seeking, that is, people who self-report that these kinds of statements represent them, are more likely to also report liking spicy food. Something about the thrill of jumping out of an airplane, I don't know, is kind of like the thrill of eating spicy food. So this is really interesting because it suggests that individual differences in flavor preferences can stem in part from actual differences in the sensory input. That is, spicy things are just experienced differently by different people, depending on physiology, but also on how much you enjoy that particular sensory experience. Some people may just like how that burn feels in addition to experiencing the burn differently. That's gotta be it, right? How we, what we taste, what we smell, what we feel. There can't be other senses that affect our perception of flavor, can there? Mm, but wait, there's more. Can what you hear possibly affect your perception of food? In order to investigate this, participants were placed in a soundproof booth with a microphone and headphones. They were told to bite into a single potato chip right next to the microphone, and the sounds from the bite were uh, recorded by the microphone, modulated, and fed back to the participants via headphones. The researchers were then able to amplify particular parts of the auditory signal so they could make the chips sound slightly different. And what they found is that when the researchers amplified the sound, so they made the chip sound louder, and particularly amplified the high pitch, those high frequency sounds, it made participants rate the chips as crispier and more enjoyable. Once, when, uh, when one of my daughters was really little, she was sitting on my lap and she was like chewing on a rubber toy and kind of like making rubber chewing sounds um, while I was eating cereal. And at one point, she happened to bite and make a squeaky rubber sound just as I took a bite of granola, and I would swear to you that the granola tasted like rubber. <gasps> it didn't taste like rubber. It had the flavor of rubber. No sense is an island. Okay, can individual differences in, in hearing affect flavor preferences? That might be a stretch for the research is needed. Last up, how does what we see affect our perception of flavor? Vision can affect flavor perception in a lot of different ways. <clears throat> in this study, participants were given raspberry flavored liquids that were red, orange, green, or clear, and then asked to identify what flavor was represented. I'm just showing you the data for raspberry here, but there, it was, uh, they, they did this for a lot of different flavors. As you can see, identification was far better for the red liquids, that is for the color that is congruent with our experience of the flavor, than for the other colors. And this makes a lot of sense. Over the course of our lives, most things that we experience that are raspberry are red. And so given what we know about how we integrate information from multiple senses, we can use those cues in a, in a complementary way in order to identify the flavor. In addition to identification, color can also affect ratings of flavor intensity. So when participants are given brown M&Ms and green M&Ms and asked to evaluate them on a lot of different criteria, how tasty are they, how chocolatey are they, and so forth, participants tend to rate brown M&Ms as tasting chocolatier than green M&Ms, despite the fact that they have the exact same stuff in them. So this suggests that the color brown is generating stronger expectations of chocolatiness than the color green is. So color clearly has a strong influence on our perception of flavor. Periodically, companies will come out with products that are atypically colored. Blue ketchup, Crystal Pepsi, Clear Kool-Aid. And in all of these cases, they're a really big hit when they first come out, right? Novelty, how cool to put blue ketchup on your onion rings. Uh, but inevitably, they crash and burn. None of these products has any kind of staying power. Why don't we like them in the long term? It's not just because it's unnatural, right? Pepsi is unnatural no matter what color it is. It's because it defies what we're used to. It defies our expectations. Even though most of this happens outside of conscious awareness, it's unexpected and jarring to have the multi-sensory input that we have spent our lives figuring out the connections between suddenly become inconsistent. Whenever these come out, I get very excited as a perceptual psychologist. And if there's one that I like, I always try to buy it right away because I know they're not gonna last. All right, so flavor preferences are in part a function of bottom-up sensory differences. 
My mom experiences spicy food and bitter food much more intensely than I do. I love food that's a bit spicy, but to her, a bit spicy is like having a mouthful of habanero. So I wouldn't like it either if I experienced it as intensely as she does. But our preferences aren't just a function of bottom-up differences. Experience matters a lot too. So here's a story. When I was a kid, I got to go to Paris with my family. Th that's me. I was too cool for pictures. Little did I know that I would want to have a picture of me in front of the Eiffel Tower when I grew up to be a college professor, but that's the best we could do. On that trip, I ate a ton of sugar crepes. This was a huge treat. It's basically just a pancake full of sugar. I couldn't believe I was getting away with it. So I ate a ton of them. Then, unrelatedly, I got the flu and I threw up a lot. And I developed this association between the sugar crepes that I had never had before and this terrible feeling of nausea. And I developed a really strong conditioned aversion to sugar crepes and kind of crepes more generally. So I associate crepes now with throwing up and with missing out on seeing the Arc de Triomphe rather than just those delicious flavor sensations. So crepes went from being yummy to being yucky as a result of that experience. So of course, the, the individual differences that we see in flavor are in part affected by these experiences that we've had, both positive and negative. And one of the strongest forces in the foods that we are exposed to is the culture that we're raised in. Different cultures differ markedly in the foods that they eat and the foods that they avoid. So for instance, to most Americans, violet scented chewing gum sounds pretty gross, but many British people love it. If you grew up in Scandinavia, you may be a fan of Turkish pepper candy, but many Americans find the salty, spicy, licorice flavor uh, pretty aversive. Now, when we talk about cultural differences, it seems easy to point at foods that we are not familiar with and think that they sound gross. But it's important to remember that many things that are culturally sanctioned in America are quite strange to people elsewhere. Here's an example. All right, so our preferences are affected by our preferences are affected in part by our experiences. Incredibly, this experience can start even before we're born. So the aromatic molecules from food can be passed from a mother to a fetus via amniotic fluid while the mother is pregnant. So this study showed that mothers who drank carrot juice during pregnancy had infants who were more likely to enjoy eating carrot flavored cereal than mothers who weren't given carrots. So maybe I like carrots as much as I do in part because I got exposure to the flavor of them before I was even born. Thanks, mom. So to summarize, our experience of flavor is highly multisensory. And our flavor preferences can be shaped by individual differences in bottom-up factors and the experiences that we have. Time to do a problem set. When you have a cold, uh, the aromatic molecules from food still make it up into your nasal cavity, but you have so much mucus in that nasal cavity that the molecules can't make contact with the olfactory receptors and can't be transduced. So basically the molecules get in your nose but aren't able to act on the olfactory system. So what this means is that we have the most difficult when you have a cold or when plugging your nose, distinguishing between things that taste the same but smell different. So in, the, in question number two, lemon and lime taste very similar but smell different. In the absence of smell, they're easily confusable. People often say when they have a cold that they can't taste anything, but this isn't technically correct. So here's a demonstration of how you can deal with this in the future. Oh, I have such a bad cold. I feel like I can't taste anything. Well, actually, your gustatory system is working perfectly well. It's your olfactory system that's impaired. Thanks, Professor. That makes me feel a lot better. So rather than saying, I don't taste anything, you can say, I have a cold, so my experience of flavor is disrupted because of limited olfactory contributions. Okay, so vision, uh, vision, affects, flavor, vision affects flavor preferences in lots of ways. The question these researchers were asking is, can color affect judgments of saltiness? So the researchers made two batches of soup, one that was kind of a dark broth color and one that was a lighter broth color. And they asked the participants to rate the saltiness of the soup. What they found is that the ratings for the two batches were identical. The effect of color, color didn't have any effect on saltiness ratings. 
So this suggests that vision is only influencing flavor uh, perception when it is expected to be informative. There aren't really any colors that are associated with the salt content of food. That is, salt occurs in all kinds of different foods that are all kinds of different colors. So we don't have strong expectations about how the color of something is going to affect its, its saltiness. So this is a nice demonstration that vision can affect our perception of flavor, but only when we have expectations about how that visual information should contribute to the flavor of the food. So people who have a high density of fungiform papilla uh, tend to avoid creamy and high fat foods. They simply experience those creamy and high fat foods more intensely, so they're too rich and kind of over the top. As a result, those people have a lower body mass index and a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. But people who have a high density of fungiform papilla also experience bitter tastes more intensely. And so they tend to avoid bitter leafy greens leading to increased risk of colon cancer. It's a nice demonstration of how the preferences that we have in part because of the physiology of our tongue can affect diet and have health consequences down the road. All right, I had you read this, this great Ariely article for today because it demonstrates something really nice about exactly how top-down information affect people's level of enjoyment and the way that they experience food. So in the three groups, uh, some people were never told that the beer has vinegar, some people were told it has vinegar before they taste it, and some people were told it has vinegar after they taste it. Now the interesting comparison is the group who was told before, so that's the gray bars, and the group who was told after, so that's the black bars. At the time of rating, both people knew that the beer had vinegar. So if the ratings are just affected by knowing the funny ingredient, we'd expect those to be equivalent, but they're not. So this indicates that it isn't just knowing about the presence of vinegar that affects people's perceptions uh, and preferences. Rather, knowing affects the actual perceptual experience. So it's only affected by knowing prior to tasting. This suggests that the top-down information is truly changing the perceptual experience and not just biasing the way that people are responding afterwards. Isn't that cool? Okay. We talked last time about how and where taste is processed in the brain. We talked last time about how and where information about taste is processed in the brain. Recall that there's a neuroanatomical dissociation between coding for the sensory experience of taste that happens in primary taste cortex and for the affective evaluation of those tastes that happens in orbitofrontal cortex. So we can also look for evidence about how top-down expectations might change physiological processing. So in this study, participants were asked to drink wine while lying in an fMRI I got to get into this kind of research. Uh, and the wine was, and the participants were either told the wine costs $10 or $90. Unsurprisingly, people said they enjoyed the wine from the $90 bottle more than the wine from the $10 bottle. Of course, it's exactly the same wine. It's just the top-down information that they're getting about the price that, that is changing. Okay, but that's not all. They also looked at the change in neural activity in orbitofrontal cortex uh, and primary taste cortex. So here the green line corresponds to the expensive bottle of wine and the blue line is the cheaper bottle. Uh, and what you can see is that activity in orbitofrontal cortex was higher, that is they showed more activity in OFC for the expensive wine than for the cheap wine. They didn't find any differences in primary taste cortex. So this demonstrates that top-down information, knowing about the price of the wine, didn't affect the sensory experience, that is, it was coded exactly the same in primary taste cortex, but it did affect how that uh, taste was perceived and affectively evaluated. Are you with me? Do you buy it that perception depends on more than just the sensory information that's present? Yeah, okay. So we need to add to our model of flavor that top-down information, the expectations that we have, can also affect our experience of flavor, and that can help explain individual differences as well. Be sure to let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for tuning into this tasty lecture, and I'll see you next time.